Hey guys, how's it going? Krapan here. Today I want to go over what would be like some of the most powerful cards in the upcoming expansions. I like to make these kind of videos just to like solidify my predictions, which are almost always wrong, but I have some experience being wrong and hopefully my understanding of the game improves over time. Now, before I go into that, I do want to uh, show you guys what the public opinion is on the cards. This was uh, a poll that I saw on Reddit and it was uh, pretty well done, very in-depth and quite a few people participated. To, to show you guys what most of you guys seem to think is really good in the upcoming expansion. And uh, more so than any other time, because you know these lists, these type of polls do come up every single expansion, I would say that this time the public opinion seems to be in line with what I think more so than ever before. Now, of course, there are a few exceptions, and uh, just to go over those, so of course, I think Call the Wild, uh, I was, you know, when I first saw the card, I think Call the Wild was easily like the safe pick for the best card of the expansion. That means it's not going to be the best card of the expansion, but it will be probably pretty damn good. Um, so, if we look on the list, a few of the cards that I really disagree with, I think Fandral Stogham is a very mediocre card. I know I was wrong about a few things when I first reviewed the card. I mentioned that I don't know how the interaction would work with transform effects. There will just be new cards. So if you if you do use like uh, you know Druid of the Flame, you will get a three mana five five, which is pretty damn good. So the card is pretty good, but. It's a card that is only pretty good if you design your deck around it, and usually if you design a deck around a card, that card needs to be absolutely bonkers, which I do not believe it is, so I do not believe it's a very good card. Um, I think it's just fair. Fair cards do not see too much play. Actually, most fair cards never see any play. And uh, one of the other things that um, kind of startled me is um, Ravaging Ghoul, I feel, is, is nowhere on that list, basically. Like, it's it's so low that it's just, it just kind of blows my mind. So I wanted to go over my top five best cards. These are ones outside of the Cthulhu mechanics, and we'll go into those, and then I want to mention a few other things, uh, get, get a few ideas flowing. So the best cards of the set outside of the Cthulhu related cards. Um, first, these, these are no, not, not in any particular order, and these are the safe picks. Mire Keeper. I think Mire Keeper will be played in a lot of Druid decks. It'll just be standard, it'll be very powerful. I initially thought the card would be a little bit weak because the five drop slot was so important for Druid with Druid of the Claw and a lot of other very powerful cards that skipping the, the five drop by playing the Mire Keeper on four would a lot of time kind of not actually help very much. Um, but we have seen a lot of powerful late game cards come up later on in the set from Whispers of the Old Gods, and now I have to say that a card like Druid of the Claw is somewhat on par with a lot of the other Druid cards around that mana range. So it's not as big of a deal as I thought it would be to skip turn five on a Druid. So Mire Keeper, I think, gains a little bit in my mind, and it was already pretty damn high in the opinion of most of us. Uh, second on my list is, uh, well, again, no, no particular order, Call the Wild. Of course, this card is insane. You get the Huffer, but the Huffer gets the, the buff from the Leoc, and you get the Taunt. So you get a Charger, a Board Attack, and a Taunt in one. Um, it's, it's three minions, but because it's alphabetical order, if you have five, if you have five minions on the board, uh, you then play this card, you get Leoc and Huffer. Huffer attacks for five. Leoc buffs the attack of five creatures by one, and you get your hero power. So you have 12 bursts in one card. You know, Hunter's never had that before. So it's it's actually crazy. Um, it's super amazing, and I wouldn't doubt to see two of these even in the aggressive mid-range Hunter lists. Um, then I have the evolution effects from Shaman. There's the Master of Evolution, which some people seem to think is the best one. Uh, it might be. And then there's also just Evolve. Uh, Evolve is maybe better. I think Evolve might be a little bit better, but it's hard to argue that both really amazing. Uh, I think Evolve is really good because of the combo potential, and combos is what makes cards super insane in Constructed. Evolve works ridiculously well with Onyxia, for instance. You, uh, you you get a 10-10 old god in some situations and a full board of two-drop minions uh, for 10 mana. That's ridiculous. 
Uh, and there's a lot of situations where you would use Evolve when you have a lot of injured minions, when you have a lot of minions that, that you just played that are heavily invested in their battle cry effect, not their stats for their mana cost. So Evolve is just completely crazy. It, it works so well with just totems. Your totems become two drops. And there's a few other synergies that I want to mention. Uh, then on my top five list, I have Halazeal. This is the card I revealed. I thought it was pretty damn crazy. And, uh, you know, a lot of people said it kind of wasn't. But when I saw it in play in... Uh, in the game highlighted by Blizzard when they showed the rest of the cards in the expansion earlier this week, I knew this card was insane. Uh, you use Halazeal with uh, Elemental Destruction, you clear the entire board, and you fully heal. That's crazy. Uh, and Shaman seems to have received the most out of the expansion, and with GVG and Nax exiting the format, Shaman also received probably the most out of TGT. Shaman is pretty stacked to uh, kind of work in many different forms. Uh, also on my top five list last is uh, Ravaging Ghoul. Yeah, I did mention it is one of the best cards out there. I think a lot of people kind of look at the uh, Whispers of the Old God set and they do see what a lot of us have been saying. It might be a controlled dominated meta. But even if that's true, and we don't know if, for sure if that's going to be true, even if that is true, people will still play aggressive decks. And Ravaging Ghoul is such a low investment because it's just a good card overall. It can activate a lot of your other cards, and it would so crush a lot of the aggressive decks out there. Uh, in terms of like what's going to work, that kind of stuff, it's very difficult to say what the best deck is going to be out there. But I have a sneaky suspicion that uh, Paladin Aggro is going to be a big thing. And, uh, well, Aggro Shaman hasn't lost very much, and that's already a big thing right now. Control does lose a lot of the hard answers to these aggressive decks. They do gain a lot of taunts, and Aggro decks lose the silences, but still, there's quite a gap to be made. I do feel like uh, Aggro decks will still see quite the presence uh, in the Whispers of the Old Gods, even in the standard format. So Ravager Ghoul is going to help warriors deal with that probably better than a lot of the other classes. Now, of course, Cthulhu is going to be one of the most powerful cards in the set. There's no doubt about that. Blizzard has invested way too much of the set to screw this up. They had to have tested it. We saw it in action. It looked ridiculous. It seems like whenever you play Cthulhu, you're going to win the game. And if you don't, you're going to fully clear your opponent's board. He's going to have very little life left. And he's going to be facing a massive minion that would otherwise kill him next turn. So even when Cthulhu doesn't win the game for you, it's going to set up a situation where your opponent is playing strictly from behind. And unless he's able to burn you down just that turn, you'll probably get maybe two or three turns um, before your opponent can really even come back on the board in any case. So Cthulhu is going to be very powerful. Without a doubt, it's just that, you know, not everyone is going to make a Cthulhu deck on every class. There's going to be some classes that are going to be more effective at Cthulhu decks, and I wanted to have my top five Cthulhu-related cards so you can maybe have some idea about what I'm thinking. You can include a few things, and maybe these might be the better classes out there. So first is Dark Urakoa. I feel this might be one of the best Cthulhu cards because it's just a really good card on its own. And, you know, a lot of the Cthulhu cards are pretty pretty good, but this is actually really good. If this did not have the Cthulhu buff, it would still probably see play in a regular Druid deck. But it's so much more than that. It's plus three, plus three on Cthulhu. Compared to a lot of the other Cthulhu cards, that is actually a lot. Like a lot, a lot. So it's an amazing card. It's a taunt. It helps Druid do what it wants to do. Ramp, survive, taunt up, don't take damage, continue playing big things. This is a big thing. It works on the bigger thing, which is Cthulhu, and it's just all around amazing. Um, Blade of Cthulhu for rogues. Now, rogue seems a very unusual candidate for a control deck, but who knows? Blade of Cthulhu makes it so they can kill a really big minion. You don't have to run removal otherwise, and it can massively buff your Cthulhu, more so than any other Cthulhu-related card out there. Then Ancient Shield Bearer. Um, just gaining 10 armor is really insane. It costs more than the, the old shield main that's exiting the block and standard, but uh, it's higher stats. 6-6 six, six is a lot stronger than 5-5. Five, five. Um, I think with this expansion, 6-6 six, six will kind of be the new like mid to late game standard. I think 5-5 five, five might be a little bit too small. And then the Twin Emperor's Velcor card, or the Vecklor card. Um, this guy's obviously super crazy. Uh, by, by the time you want to play the card, you are obviously going to have a 10 10 Cthulhu if you're playing that type of deck. Um, and yeah. Taunting up, moving into the late game is exactly what you want to be doing in deck. This card is obviously going to be absurd. 
Then we have Disciple of Cthulhu. Um, this card is just super crazy because a lot of the Cthulhu decks kind of miss out. They have kind of like clunky early game because in the early game, a lot of the Cthulhu buffs um, have a pretty high price. This just doesn't have one. Uh, this is one of those cards that if it didn't interact with Cthulhu at all, people would still actually play it. So you can bet your ass that will be an every single Cthulhu related deck. And uh, that that is a pretty big deal. That means a lot. That means that any two health minion is a lot worse than a three health minion. Uh, I think the dominance of the two, three, two drops will continue over the three, two, two drops in constructed play, at least just because of this card. Now, I mentioned that these cards are all like the safe picks. They're obviously pretty good cards, but these are not usually the cards that end up dominating the game. In fact, I don't think they ever have been. Whenever there's been an expansion, the best cards that have ended up being the best cards are usually ones that people don't really hype up too much, but they're usually cards that have a lot of potential. Now, most of these cards end up not living to their full potential or even close, but I wanted to give you guys a list for some of the things you might want to try that might get a little bit out of hand, that are not necessarily crazy, but have the potential to be. So first is Ragnaros the Light Lord. Um, if it if it comes to a stage in the meta where healing is actually extremely important, um, Blizzard has cut back on a lot of cards in standard that actually heal you effectively, and Ragnaros the Light Lord is absolutely insane for healing you effectively. Um, yeah, that's really just about it. Um, healing has been an extremely big deal in the game for a long time, and getting an 8-8 eight, eight and healing yourself for 8 and having this as a perpetual effect is absurd. And Steward of Darkshire, I did mention that Agro Paladin does have the potential to get really out of control, and I think this is a card that could really help that happen. Uh, putting Divine Shield on just a bunch of garbage makes it so any kind of just simple attack buffs, rather than attack and health buffs, become super powerful, especially when it's a tempo game and your opponent can't afford paying, and if they do, you can usually win by Divine Favoring later, and Divine Favor didn't get nerfed, and it was on a lot of people's list for getting nerfed. So, Agro Paladin is very likely going to be a thing, and this card should help it quite a bit, but again, I can't really know for sure. Then I have Harold Volage, the Priest Legendary. A lot of people seem to hype up this new uh, six mana mage card. Like, oh my god, you get a three drop and it's a five five and it costs six mana, that's insane! Yeah, that's pretty good, but, you know, Harold Volage is basically going to have that effect every single time. If you just have two random minions, you're going to get two one ones and the body. Even if they do nothing, that's still about the same as getting a random 3-drop. If you get 3, that's almost always going to be better than getting a random 3-drop. And if your minions have effects, Herald Village is going to be absolutely insane. I haven't quite figured out the best way to combo this card and to make, you know, some really crazy stuff happen. But I would imagine that someone will figure it out, and I would imagine it is going to be pretty damn busted. And we have Shadowcaster. Shadowcaster has been talked about a lot uh, with Bran, with, you know, Hobgoblin and Wild, just so many interactions. Getting miniature versions of high effect minions can get really crazy, but I don't know if Rogue can really pull it off in a control deck, so that's why I'm not too sure about the card. This last one, the Nerubian Prophet, is probably on nobody's radar, but I think it is one of the best cards to be released. Uh, I think so just because it, it is just a really good card on its own, and it's going to have some, some pretty good effect just by playing the card for zero at any stage in the game will give you a tempo effect after you use like a board clear or something, but it's not only that. Um, I think Shaman is going to see a lot of play. I think a lot of Shamans are going to use cards like Evolve, the Evolution Effects. And if you think, if you ever use Evolve, you would be crazy not to run Nerubian Prophet in your deck. Just think about it, right? Like, if your opening hand has Nerubian Prophet, it's a 4 4 for 3 mana. That's pretty good especially because people are going to play things with over 2 health, so you're not usually going to run into like the 4-2 stat line for 3 drops. So this guy's basically going to kill almost every single 3 drop just if you draw him in your opening hand. No big deal. It's a pretty good card, right? But if you ever want to play Evolve, you can just save this guy until a turn where you do want to play Evolve, and you get a random 7 drop on your board for free. Okay, that's totally crazy okay trust me it's totally crazy so if you do want to play the shaman evolve deck make sure to involve this guy in your super combos 
I also want to mention a f another another little list today. This list is for the most redeemed cards that are from sets prior to Whispers of the Old Gods that will probably, at least in my mind, see uh, more play or just see some play in the standard format, as otherwise they probably wouldn't see very much at all. So first on my list is Just a Card True Heart. Just a Card does see some play, but it's, it's basically strictly in Control Warrior. I think Just a Card True Heart will just see more play across a lot of other classes, just because, oh, that's also in Priest, just because um, when the game is a lot slower, you will have a lot more opportunity to hero power, and if your hero power generates a lot more value, that will give you a massive advantage throughout the game. It's basically like an Inspire card, and the Inspire effect doesn't go away when the minion dies. That's why it's so powerful in these drawn-out control games. Thunderbuff Valiant, I think, is a no-brainer. There's a lot of totem synergy. There's a lot of synergy to just, you know, popping up a bunch of junk. Well, you can buff your junk with Thunderbuff Valiant, and then when you can't, you can use the other cards. You know, these type of cards just work very similarly, and they're fairly synergistic with the cards I've been releasing, so I, I would... <laughs> I, I would really be surprised to see this guy not see a ton of play in the upcoming expansion. And I have Tuscar Totemic, again for the same reason, uh, totems are going to have more synergy, having a lot of minions on the board, you know, when you talk about Evolve, Evolve will turn this into a 4-drop and it'll turn the totem into at the very least a 2-drop, so that's pretty good, but some totems cost 3 mana, some totems are much more threatening than others, and you do have additional totem synergy on the side, so just so much synergy will probably make this card uh, back into the meta. And I have Seal of Champions. Um, I think even if Agro Paladin doesn't launch and doesn't use this card, a lot of mid-range Paladins will start using this card. While Paladin does have fairly efficient removal overall, Seal of Champions is that card that I have been on the receiving end in Arena way too often. And I can tell you, it is, it is the most soul-crushing card. It's that moment where your opponent has basically nothing, and they... You put, a, you put a big minion in play, they play Seal of Champions, they hit it and they lose like a 1-1 one, one guy and you lost your big minion and then they have a minion that is not originally a big minion, it's like a 3-drop or a 4-drop that has such high attack, it then denies you from playing another big minion. So Seal of Champions I think will fit perfectly into just a very slightly slower metagame and I do think we can realistically expect that. And finally, on my top five redeemed list, I have the Naga Sea Witch. Even though this card had some promise uh, when it was launched, it didn't quite have the threat that I thought it, ha it should have. But now with Whisper of the Old Gods introducing a colossal number of huge minions, high mana minions, crazy effect old gods, all these like ridiculously high cost cards that whenever they're played, you'd win the game. Well, when someone plays a Naga Sea Witch, and you have this on your mind, you might be like, yeah, I need to kill that card. So yeah, you'll probably have to kill the Naga Sea Witch every single time. So 5 out of 5-5, five, five, that's must kill, and if your opponent can't kill it, you have the opportunity to play like an old god potentially, that's really crazy. If you're running 10 mana cards like the old gods, well, you might as well throw a Naga Sea Witch there anyway, because you can play it and then play your 10 mana card alongside on turn 10. If you think something like Cthulhu might see some play, well, you still have to get to turn 10, and if your deck is designed to get to turn 10, Naga Sea Witch will almost always have some value. So that's going to be it, guys. It's been, it's been a blast to review some of these cards, and I hope I've delivered a little bit more insight into what might work, what might not, and maybe I've inspired you guys to tweak or build a few more decks when the expansion is launched. I'm so excited to play, and I hope you guys are too. I hope you guys have enjoyed my review, and I'll see you guys tomorrow.